Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. This is Sid from Elliott Wave Plus, and this is the April 23 of 2024 edition of my quarterly premium plan webinar, where I spell out uh, virtually everything that uh, we do here at Elliott Wave Plus as sort of an overview. But um, and sometimes I specialize uh, or try to focus on uh, particular uh, items that we cover at LA Wave Plus. And so this uh, quarter, I think I'm gonna go into more of the nuts and bolts of my um, mom uh, propri proprietary um, algo, momentum algo. And we uh, provide information every night to premium plan members uh, as far as signals, trade signals. And we also, once a quarter, uh, we re-backtest uh, and optimize, and we develop a spreadsheet on which items over the last three years would have performed the best had current settings been in place over the last three years. And we do that as a, every quarter right after we finish the new um, optimization of the um, indicators and uh, it also figures uh, when we do the uh, re-optimization, it figures uh, the optimum initial stop size, whether to use a trailing stop, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to go into that quite a bit this time. And I'm also going to um, look at probably the best uh, the example of which item has doing, been doing the best with the algo trading the automated trading. This is trading based on momentum lately. And that, the answer to that is going to be gold. So we're going to take a, a real hard look at the nuts and bolts of the gold algo. I'll show you the equity curve of the gold algo that uh, shows had you had the current settings in place starting three years ago and just done everything that the algo said to do. And the, and those uh signals, buy signals, exit signals, change to a trailing stop signals, exit signals, et cetera, et cetera, um, would have been provided on a nightly basis uh, for our premium plan members. So we're gonna look real uh, hard at that one because it uh, really continues to be the smoothest trending, uh, easy, um, most reactive item that of all the 20 plus items that we do algos on. Um, in other words, it, the way it moves works very well with automated trading. So I'm going to look at that and uh, also sentiment conditions. That's another uh, item that we provide every night for premium plan members uh, on uh, probably over 30 items now, most of them commodities, but it, many times uh, sentiment conditions, uh, when you compare a retail traders a positioning to commercials positioning will key you into some key potential uh, trend changes on the near horizon. So we're gonna look at that. Also gonna look at um, my trend charts Trend charts are something that we send uh, over a dozen of those uh, out every night to each and every subscriber at all price levels, even the cheapest price level at $25 a month. I'm going to show you how effective that item has been, especially in the U.S. stock market, the ES contract, in other words, the S&P, uh, um, over the last several months. Then I'll show uh, toward the end uh, the Elliott Wave and Hearst uh, combined proprietary analysis that I do on a number of items, and I'll take requests on that. And then at the end, we'll uh, we'll have an offer, and it's the same one I usually uh, offer on these things. It's uh, if you have never subscribed before to any of my paid services and you would like to do, give it a shot, um, I'll give you a 50% 50, 50 refund on your first month as a paying subscriber. So um, that's everything I'm going to cover today, uh, kind of an outline of it. So we're going to start first with um, our sortable spreadsheet. So 
This is something we produce once a quarter. It takes all of the algo back tests that we do. So we uh, provide this uh, a um, momentum algo signal chart to premium plan subscribers every night on all of these items right here. That's Monday through Friday. I'm going to turn off the video myself so you can see a little better. And then after um, we do all the back testing and optimization, we create this sortable spreadsheet and we'll make this available to you to download. It's just a standard Excel spreadsheet, but you can sort the columns. So right now we are sorted, I believe, well, let me just go ahead and sort it. We're going to sort it by return on investment. And that, to me, this is the ultimate column here of uh, from all of the statistics we've gathered from all the back tests. And uh, gold is once again the winner. I think this is three or four quarters in a row that gold has been the smoothest trending item and, the, and the, therefore the easiest to trade based on momentum. Over the last three years, it's uh, the, had the current settings been in place um, during that entire three-year period. It would have uh, put in 83 trades. 46 of those would be winners. 37 would be losers. Here's the real, here's the real difference maker. The average winner was $4,471, whereas the average loser was under two thousand dollars so uh the average winner was well over twice as large as the average loser so the winning percent of of 55 percent had you started with an account of twenty three thousand five fifty, and you traded one contract at a time and just followed the rules of the algo exactly uh would have brought in over a three-year period one hundred and thirty one thousand eight hundred and eighty two dollars worth of profit that's a return on investment of 560% in three years. The most consecutive winners during the three-year back test was six. Most consecutive losers was five. During the, that string of losers, the maximum drawdown during that period was $10,460. Um, it uses a fixed stop initially of $3,500. Now you might say, oh, geez, I can't, I'm not going to risk $3,500 on every trade. And that's fine. Uh, what you could do would, instead of trading the GC futures contract, you could trade the MGC contract, the micro E-mini, which is one-tenth the size. And if we're trading one of those at a time, your fixed stop, your initial stop would be $350 dollars not 3500 so you just divide that by 10. um and then um uh, and that's the fixed stop uh, for long positions and there's also to some different size trailing stops and so the way the algo works is uh, it, it stays with the, the initial fixed stop for a period of time, but if it senses any loss of momentum on the trade, it will flip to a trailing stop. And so we're going to go over that all in just a minute. This reminds me, um, I forgot to do something, and that is uh, um, give you my disclaimer, show you my disclaimer. I'll do that very quickly. To see my disclaimer, go to my website, elliotwaveplus.com, and scroll to the bottom of any page on the site. Click on the Terms of Service Disclaimer tab. And there's the disclaimer. It's there all the time. Please go there and read that in full. If I were to summarize it in one sentence, it would be, there's risk of loss in all trading. One additional item, when, uh, um, or bit of the verbiage here that I want to point out, especially on the premium plan uh, webinar quarterly, is that um, past performance is not indicative of future results. And that's why I'm so very careful when I'm talking about this spreadsheet. I'm talking about a back test. 
had the settings that, that, that have been optimized currently been in place the last three years. So this is theoretical. Then, um, and had you taken mimicked every action of the algo, then it, it would have brought in this amount. So are, are we absolutely positively guaranteed that gold is going to continue to be one of the smoother traders? Well, uh, uh, it has been for quite a few months, uh, several quarters in a row now. But before that, it was the S&P and the, y, uh, the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average were usually at the top of the list. But they have fallen back. And uh, precious metals are um, le have been leading the pack in, in recent quarters. So the, the markets can change character. And I think we recently had a very important change in character, especially in the U.S. stock market. And we'll talk about that in a second. So um, there's all kinds of different kinds of traders out there. Some people, some people might think, you know what, Elliott Wave is fooey. I don't believe in it. Uh, I'll never believe in it. I be, I'd like to trade based on indicators. And for those people, you might enjoy this uh, trading based on algos or using other indicators. And I have other indicators that I um, send out, uh, like, for instance, our trend daily trend charts, send that out to subscribe uh, every paying subscriber at every level, every weekday night. So you, everyone can be aware of the current trend um, on on a number of items. So um, there's my terms of service and, my, and, and disclaimer. So we've looked at the spreadsheet. I'm going to put that away for a second. And now we're going to go to the charts. And um, the first thing I want to show you uh, this quarter in the webinar is the gold algo. So this algo, um, there's a number of settings, but here's the basic idea. This moving average right here, this light green, or if it's if it's moving to the downside, if it's sloping to the downside, it's it's dark red. That is an adaptive moving average. It's a a type of moving average that Perry Kaufman uh, devised. And I even show you up here what I use for the settings. M8, 2, and 30 are the settings on the adaptive moving average. Now, when they're set that way, it has a tendency to hug up fairly close to price. Now, the way Perry Kaufman originally designed that adaptive moving average was um, with basic settings of maybe 10, 2, and 30. And so it wouldn't hug quite as close to price. And the way he originally designed, devised it is if you, if you saw a crossover of price for, that was staying above that line and it crossed below that line, that basically constitutes a sell signal. I don't use it in that way. I simply back test it and use the slope of it so if it is closing each day higher than it closed the previous day it is in an upslope and therefore it is colored green if if the opposite is occurring it is colored red and in a way that what the algo really is using that for is to develop the trend direction also, the other indicator that is a critical uh, component of developing the signals is this WBRSI 3M3. So that is a Walter Bressert <clears throat> indicator, and it's essentially an RSI. And then you take a three-period moving average, sim simple moving average of the RSI, and then you take a three-period moving average of that three-period moving average. So it's a double smooth. RSI. And that's that dark black line right there. And then Walter Bresser suggested that you could put a moving average on that and use crossovers as signals. 
So what we what I really have is two different indicators that were originally designed by pioneers in technical trading to develop uh, buy and sell signals. <clears throat> and so what the algo does is if the slope of the adaptive moving average is up and it's therefore light green and the and the Walter Bressert is on a green crossover. In other words, it's riding above its moving average. It is on a buy. The minute those two agree, the very second they those two agree, you get this big triangle here, and that's a buy signal. The, the very second that those two agree on a sell, the slope of the adaptive moving average is down and you're on a negative crossover on the adaptive moving average, that is a sell signal. Something additionally that I use on this uh, Walter Bressert indicator is if it is sloping up and all of a sudden it starts to slope to the downside, then I, th those little arrows that appear down here also appear up here. And that indicates that you have a loss of momentum to the upside. And that is when the um, algo will start trailing the stop. So let's look at this buy signal right here. Now, the, the trend never changed. It was always up. But the Walter Bressert had a negative crossover until it came back and, and got a green crossover here. So when, when you get the, the Walter Bressert green block crossover and the, it agrees with the adaptive moving average slope, you get a buy signal. Now, it is, you might ask, well, what's that little circle right there? Well, that is something I devised that um, I can also backtest. By the way, I backtest on the moving average of the Walter Bressert. And I backtest on two of the parameters on the adaptive moving average. And then also, if the buy signal comes in on an inordinately long candle, It was, I, mean, I back test it because usually when you get a new buy signal on an inordinately long candle, and, and that is designated here by that little O, that little O right there, usually there's a pullback of X number of pips or tip, uh, ticks before it continues higher. And based on back testing here, uh, on long entries, it looks, when it gets an especially long signal candle, buy candle, it looks for a 26 or 27 tick pullback before getting in there. In other words, you put a limit buy order in 27 ticks below the clo close of the pri pri prior candle. Now, that's in 27 ticks really isn't very much on daily chart but at least it gets in a little lower. And if, when, when you're shorting and you have a long, uh, like for instance, it gave a sell signal right here, but that was an especially long and inordinate, unusually long signal candle. And therefore it looked for a pullback on the very next candle of, based on back testing, 60 ticks. It didn't get it. It didn't get that much of a pullback. And therefore, yes, we did get a limit sell signal on this day, April 22, but it didn't fill. So it, the, the, the algo is still flat. It's not short gold. So um, I think gold makes a, a really a good case for something right here as well. So the, these big green blocks are winning trades.
theoretical winning trades that had you had the, the settings that we have right now been in place the last three years, then these trades, that would have been a winning trade. This here's a loser, dark red. Notice you get some losers. There's a dark red loser. There's a dark red loser. There's a small green winner. There's a small green winner. Some of these are on long positions and some are on short position. Winner, winner, small winner, winner, so on, so on, so forth. So what happens just on this trade? It, it saw a lot of momentum here. It looked for a little pullback. It got in long, but right here, it showed the, a little red arrow. And that means that the Walter Bressert, all of a sudden, a, a double smooth RSI started sloping to the downside. And that upon that candle, the algo changed the stop to a trailing stop. And it, it continued to the, the Walter Bresser continued to slope to the downside as gold continued higher until finally it got a sell signal. They had this big reversal candle here that was on April 12 and it got out. Now you might look at that and go, Hey, Hey, wait just a minute. Look at everything you left on the table because it moved up. Gold moved up another 2.66% up here said, and you missed, you missed that. You, you wouldn't believe how often I get that kind of commentary. And, and, but look, as it turns out, it was very wise to not get back in as it's given all that back. And now the price is back below the exit point back here. I, I recently got that comment from an actual subscriber. They, he was saying, Hey, Sid, that are actually uh, somebody that watches my, my quarterly premium plan, Weber. He goes, Hey, last time back in January, you were looking for a top in market, but it moved 4% higher than you said. What do you have to say about that? And that was before the market actually over the, the last several days, not, not today or yesterday, but last week, primarily pulled back, you know, in some, some items, six, 7%, matter of fact, over 10% on the semiconductor. And it, it pulled back pretty much back to where I was saying, you watch out this, this market looks overbought. So None of these systems, whether it's automated trading or whether it is my own wave counts and what I'm saying, when I'm incorporating all of the different things I, that I incorporate into that, which includes overbought, oversold, sentiment, et cetera, et cetera. They're all designed to t take a reasonable look at the market and not to try to catch every little tick this trading the markets is not like being a concert pianist so a professional concert pianist they will go into carnegie hall and play for thousands of people and they will play for half an hour an hour or longer and they will never miss a single note every note will be complete and total perfection because they had per performed it many Practice it, practice it many times, memorize it. But what that pianist is not dealing with is un uncertainty. They're dealing with complete and total certainty. But when you're working with the markets, you're dealing with uncertainty in many ways. And therefore, perfection is simply impossible. Um, and so what, if you can come out of it, making more than you lost, then, um, then you're a winner. Uh, if you can reduce your risk at particular times of, of, uh, where the market is incredibly stretched, you should do that. You may miss out on some stuff, but, um, uh, on, on a few ticks here and there, but, but that is just part of the game. Um, so 
I, I think I've kind of explained the algo on, on how it handles itself. There's two other indicators down here that are very important. This one is uh, the daily sentiment index. This indicates how, what percentage of retail traders are currently bullish. Now, at the close today, 69% of retail traders were, were bullish. That's not a, a super high, high number. As a matter of fact, recently, about the highest uh, percentage of retail traders has been around the 86. That's, that was during this period right here. That's def definitely a warning sign. But based on back testing on over the last three years, unless gold is um, the DSI and gold is above ninety seven percent retail traders, there's no reason to not take a buy signal. On the other hand, on the low end, if the DSI is below eight, it is not a good idea to take a new sell signal. Does anybody have any questions about the uh, gold algo so far? If so, just put it into the chat and I will try to answer it. And then this indicator down here is an important one too. This is the blue line is the money flow index. The black line is the RSI, standard RSI. So what is the money flow index? It's, a, it's just the RSI, but it is weighted by volume. And so when you see the, uh, a move to the upside in gold like this, it's, I think it's very important to look at the money flow. Is there a lot of volume behind the move? And yes, there, there was. There's, there was the blue line was riding above the black line this entire time. There's nothing in the algo that looks at this for clues about signals. I just included on every algo screenshot as an additional, very important indicator for you to consider. There are going to be times where you, you might think about not taking an algo signal, um, just using your, because it's um, so overbought or whatever, or if the DSI is stretched beyond belief or it's on something of that nature, that's a reason I put these on, but, uh, Look, look what happened back here on gold. So this was the low in early October of 2023. So that was the beginning of the current uh, big rally in gold. So the, by the way, it was short and it made money on the short and, and immediately and when they flipped to a long and it made money on that long signal. And notice th that the money flow indicator overtook the RSI to the upside right there. There was volume behind this move. But then when it made its next move to the upside, notice that the, the um, um, blue line was under the black line at the point that it peaked. That indicator threw up these two pink warning lines. And guess what happened for the next one, two, three, three months, gold did nothing. That was a warning sign that, 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 that at that moment, gold, the peak in gold occurred on lower volume, and therefore it probably would not continue strongly to the upside at that time. And it didn't. It moved sideways for the next two and a half months. But then all of a sudden right here, you got this big spike in the volume right in here. And uh, that was a really good sign. And then we got this, this move up on the Walter Bressard in a green block. And then we also had the slope of the adaptive moving average green. That was a nice win, um, buy signal. And that came in on February 19. And it, it continued to go up until it started to lose on a bit of momentum. And what the algo does is it, it rings the register so you can keep that money instead of giving it back. And, the, and then there was about a three-week sideways period before the next, next move to the, um, to the upside. So, um, 
Yes, this winner right here could have been theoretically bigger. It was $11,260 winner with one contract. But it's a good thing that it didn't stay in the trade because if you would have had to sit through a t almost $13,000 drawdown uh, over the next, over the last couple of days. So there's gold. One other thing I wanted to show you about the premium plan members get to see every night is the sentiment um, screenshots. So this is by proprietary sentiment uh, conditions uh, template. And I, I have the, we provide this on over 30 items, uh, mostly um, uh, commodities, but certainly on every item th that we can. In order to produce this, we need it to be an item that where the daily sentiment index is, and data is available on it. So um, on, as far as the stock market goes, it, it's available on the ES contract, the S&P, and on the NQ contract, the NASDAQ. But it's not available on, on the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the Russell. And it's not available on ETFs. But here's, here's what this sentiment conditions. Notice I haven't showed you a single Elliott wave count yet. Nothing. I'm showing you momentum algos that are hugely successful. And now I'm showing you sentiment that clues you in about what uh, kind of turn you might expect next. At this low back in October of 2023, the, there was uh, leading into that low, there was only 8% of retail traders that were bullish. Well, that is an important number. It's the, it's, when you get down into single digits on retail sentiment, on gold, it's time to look at buying. And guess who was buying? the commercials. So the commercials are the producers of the gold. They're the gold miners and any other company whose job it is to, they're involved with the production and sale of, of gold is considered a commercial. And they, they have large hedging accounts. And so when they're heavily long, and that's what this green zone means right here, this this indicator right here is gold producers or commercials positioning as it relates to their most bullish and bearish position over the last 12 months. This indicator is their, their positioning as it relates to their most bullish and bearish positioning over the last six months. And this indicator is their positioning as a percent of open interest. So, when the commercials are um, willing to hold long positions overnight, but almost no one else is, that's when you see that turn green. So you really hit a perfect storm right here. Retail traders heavily short. Retail traders are uh, reliably, totally and completely wrong at major turns in the markets. They're all piled in on one side of the boat. They were all short, almost all. And so it, it became so extreme that there was no, no retail traders left to short it. At the same time, commercials were all taken. They had taken all their hedges off. The reason they have hedging accounts is during times uh, where they think you're, there's going to be a pullback in the price of gold, they will short gold to make money in their futures account as gold goes down to offset the fact that they're having to sell the pro their produced product for less. So perfect stem, I call this a perfect storm of bullishness and, and, um, then on the DSI, I have a moving three three day moving average, simple moving average of the DSI. And when it's sloping to the upside, it's green. And when it's sloping to the downside, it's red. So, and if it's sloping to the upside, it's green and the candles turn green. If it's sloped to the downside, it's red and the candles turn red. In other words, the candle color becomes somewhat of a signal. These boxes right here 
will indicate commercials being long. So the thin box is the commercials as a percent of open interest. The medium walled box is the six month look back. And the thick walled box is the 12 month look back. So this was a perfect storm of bullishness on October 3, and it really paid off. Notice that what the commercials do is as an, an the item went up, they started adding on their hedges again. So they basically fade trends. As a trend goes up, they build a position against it. And when a when a trend goes down, they remove their their short positions. And so they're, the way they trade is they look for a reversion to the mean. So right through here, they were heavily hedged and retail traders got up to an 83% bullish. And that created this bearish period. So what are these um, these tan zones? Well, that means that the ADX indicator is over 60. This is often a warning, a uh, pretty reliable warning on, some, on many items that an item is uh, getting into fairly severely short-term overbought or oversold territory. Notice right here, there, it, it was oversold. Right here, the gold was oversold because you got the tan stripe. Anyway, that's the way the cinema conditions work. And the cinema conditions lately have been warning uh, of a pullback, and we're getting one. They've especially been warning of a pullback in silver. We have the, the ADX indicator. We got this tan zone here. The ADX indicator is over 60. It was, uh, silver was overbought. We also have the commercials have all hedged and the and retail got up to a 91 here. These are all warning signs that we're 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 probably headed for a pullback here. And that appears to be what we're getting now. So um uh, if you wanted to uh, now I'm gonna go back to uh oh and by the way, the second best performing algo was silver. And you can see lots of big green boxes. Those are the winning trades. The, to the losing trades are smaller. They're in red. Does anybody have any idea why the losing trades would be small and the winning trades would be larger on these algos? The reason is because it uses protective stops. It uses protective stops. However, it does not start out with a, a fixed price objective. This is something that many algos do. They'll say, okay, I'm, I'm going to put in a thousand dollar stop and I'm going to look to make a thousand. So that, that is really just a one to one risk to, to reward. So now I'm, a two to one risk to reward to reward would be, I'm going to put in a thousand dollar stop and I'm going to set a take profit level at $2,000 profit. That's closer to what this algo does. But when you have a, a heavy trending item like we've seen recently in silver and gold, this doesn't have a fixed price objective. It only takes profit when uh, it gets across over the Walter Bresser. So that could be much, much higher than anyone would dream to set uh, as their fixed price objective on, on on the trade this move to the upside recently in silver brought in 14 almost fifteen thousand dollars worth of profit with one contract now unfortunately there is not a 10 one tenth size contract on silver that's why i think gold is a better item for many retail traders to trade because they have the MGC contract. While I'm here, oh, oh, let's see. 
I'm going to show you the on the uh, algo very quickly. I'm going to show you the, how sophisticated these algos are. Um, if I were to add it to strategy, here are all of the parameters so that I've just laid out to you that were that are back tested and optimized on on the gold on our proprietary gold momentum algo. And that includes the initial fixed stop for longs, the initial fixed stop for shorts, the trade size of the trailing stop on longs, and the size of the trailing stop on shorts. Con getting the stop size correct is essential for a profitable algo. Um, but the thing I wanted to show you is I'm going to run that algo. And what, what you'll see is that the data that's in these boxes, like net profit of 131,882, it comes right from this results window. And the thing I wanted to show you was the equity curve, the equity curve. So this is where the, three years ago when it started, and this is the amount of equity in the account. If you took in every trade verbatim, and this of course is theoretical, had current um, uh, settings of the indicators been the same over those three years. I will represent to you that from quarter to quarter on gold, it's these set, these indicator settings don't change very much at all, very subtle changes. But that's one of the best equity curves you'll ever see on anything, on anything. It's pretty much almost a straight line to the upside. Yeah, there's some losers in there, but they're small in comparison with the winners, and they're fewer than the uh, winners. So I'm going to flip now. I want to show you the kind of what, the back testing and optimization. I want to show you the sentiment. So what is there anything that's in a, kind of a perfect storm uh, on sentiment right at the moment um, where it might be? dangerous to continue to try to chase the trend uh there yeah i would say there's a couple items i'll show you one of one one of them is silver the the silver's in a perfect storm of bearish sentiment right now the commercials are fully hedged and retail is very long same thing on copper so on copper right now there's several things uh, uh, working against copper now, it's been all the rage in, in all the news sources to claim that copper is, in, we're, we're in a copper shortage, and they very well may be. But if we are moving into a recession next, uh, that shortage could turn to a surplus in a hurry. Um, there's several things showing on this particular chart. One is that commercials are all positioned fully hedged. In other words, they think this move to the upside will re revert to the mean soon enough. Whereas retail traders are still extremely bullish on copper. That is what I call a perfect storm of bearishness. Commercials are bearish, retail, um, heavily bearish. Uh, retail traders are heavily bullish. Also, we have a, one of those brown zones uh, indicating that it's extremely overbought at the moment. It's more overbought than it's been right now or just a couple of days ago than it's been at any point going back, you know, this entire chart, which is companies encompasses about a year. Additionally, we're in a, we're in a period of bearish seasonality and on a lot of these, um, uh, sentiment condition screenshots. If we're in a period of bearish or bullish seasonality, I'll show it to you on the chart. And if we're in a period of bearish seasonality on copper until May 15. So copper's uh, been rip run to the upside. However, um, according to the sentiment conditions, it's, it's time for a pullback. And the pullback we've seen in the last couple of days probably isn't even close to being enough, not with these kind of extremes. Um, now I'm going to move to the stock market. And I want to show you 
uh, I remind you of uh, what I was saying uh, three months ago in January. So um, uh, in January, <clears throat> well, I'll just show you. <laughs> I'll show you on the on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. <laughs> so we're getting into some Elliott Wave and, and some Hearst right now. And so um, the most important uh, things I can show you on this quarterly chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average is that they're still, and this is, I've been talking about these Fibonacci targets for years. I was talking about them three months ago and they haven't changed. And that is there's three Fibonacci targets in a cluster on the Dow Jones Industrial Average that still haven't been hit yet for the end of wave five of five of five of five up from the 1932 low. But we're getting really close to those targets. So um, the one target is 41,020. Another target is 41,981. That's the best target for the end of the fifth wave in Burgundy. So that'd be the fifth wave up from 1974. One, two, three, four, five. The This target, the teal target, would be the best target for an extended fifth wave up from the 1974 low. One and teal, two, three, four, and then five. Very extended fifth wave target. Whereas the... Um, the because we had or we've already within the fifth wave up from the 1974 low seen it a highly extended wave three we would not look for wave five in burgundy or primary degree to be an extended fifth wave we expect it to be normal and a normal fifth wave in uh the best target for normal fifth waves in the stock market using a similar chart you would not get these same levels on um, using any chart on, for instance, Thinkorswim. It does not have Similog charts. It has linear charts only. But the best target is where the fifth wave up in, in Burgundy or primary degree would be equal to the net traveled of one through three. That's one, two, three times 0.618. So you measure from here to here, take that times 0.618 and add that to the bottom tick in, in 2009 and you get 41,981. A bit higher. And then up from the 2009 low, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 5. So this needs to be a five-wave structure. And uh, the best target for the end of the fifth wave in black or intermediate degree up from the 2009 low is 43,652. And that is where black wave five would be that same 0.618 times the net traveled of black one through three. These are very, very important to my work. All of three of those, because I've got a, a hundred years of data here. I can set these long-term Fibonacci's and I can expect as an Elliottician that the market is going to put in a significant and major large degree top somewhere in that zone. Look at the massive divergences we're getting as um, on this quarterly chart. We can see those same divergences on a monthly chart. The all-time high on the RSI occurred in January of 2018 on a monthly chart. And then there was a, a lower high at the January of 2022 high. And, and this most recent high, even though price did make it up quite a bit higher than the Jan of 2022 high, it still didn't get back up to that level. And so now we've got two divergences in place including on this monthly chart. Now, the, the, what's the difference between my wave count now and the wave count back then, three months ago, was, is that um, 
I was already counting, and this, in, I believe, ended up being correct, and I was one of the first to float this idea that the entire blast move up from the March of 2020 low was, in fact, an ABC zigzag. It was not a five-wave structure, not like most other mainstream Elioticians were calling it. So many were thinking that's as high as the stock market would ever go. There were several reasons why I didn't think so. One is that that Fibonacci target zone had not been entered yet. The other was that I didn't think that it carved out the internal subdivisions looked like a five wave structure. I think it looked like an ABC zigzag and the relationship between the A wave and the C was a C wave in pink here was correct for a zigzag, not, not a five wave structure. And so the, what I was expecting three months ago was that um, this initial pullback in three waves would be followed by a three wave move to the upside, but it would not make a new all time high. And therefore we would get a, a longer lasting ending contracting diagonal. So the reason so such a big deal that this was an ABC to the upside is that indicates that it was likely wave one of an unfinished ending contracting diagonal. Now, if you have a Frost and Proctor book handy and you look at diagonals, you will see that typically And, and remember, in Elliott Wave, what we do, we are looking at what is most likely based on history. Typically, wave two of a diagonal will be a deep retrace. Well, this retrace was only 0 0.382. And normally, uh, according to the Frost and Prechter, a, a wave two of an ending contracting diagonal would typically retrace anywhere from uh, 66%, I think it is, to 81%, pretty deep. Let's, let's just say at least a 0.618 retrace. Well, this was half of that size. And so I didn't think wave two was over yet, but apparently it was over in October of 2022. And what we end up here with because this still is an ABC zigzag, if we, is we ended up with an inordinately shallow wave two of a diagonal, an unusually shallow uh, a wave two of a diagonal. Now, since then, because we made new highs here, above the highs back in January of 2022. And, we, and we've done that in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P, and the NASDAQ, both the, the, the NASDAQ 100 and the NASDAQ composite. But we have not made a new high during this period on above what the high back, highs back here is transports and the Russell and utilities. So it's not a universal situation where everything made new high recently above these highs over here, which um, is what is commonly referred to if that ends up going down in history as, uh, as, the, as the ultimate highs that we're going to see in all those indices, that, that would be a non-confirmation, and that's bearish. But I'm not willing to say it's a non-confirmation yet because I, I don't think this diagonal is over yet. And I'll show you my chart on transports and utilities in a minute. So um, I think this uh, structure to the upside in the Dow Jones Industrial Average is very clear in A. And then, uh, and that was a five wave structure, one, two, three, four, five, and then three waves for down for an A, three waves up for a B, five down for a C. That is a textbook running flat for wave B. And this was a wave C to the upside that simply became rather extended, but it, it um, my best target for the end of the C wave was at this pink 
line right here, which it, it had almost hit in January, the last time I did one of these. Well, it ended, it ended up managing to scrape just a bit higher. Could your one, two, three be the first ABC of a first wave of diagonal? One, two, three in what color? Oh, so A, B, C, and this is wave one of a diagonal here. Is that what you're saying? We just saw? Uh, no, um, because this move up here uh, was not an impulse. Um, so each leg of a diagonal has to be an A, B, C. So the internal subdivision, and that would be a five, three, five structure. No, I would say absolutely not. That's, that couldn't be. Because the internal wave structures just, just simply are way, way different than that. Um, so I've got, this is one of the, the contracting diagonal two an abnormally shallow wave two within a diagonal. That's where I messed up last time. I was looking for something normal. Well, I'm, I guess I should have been looking for something abnormal. Uh, halfway kidding about that. And now, and then an A, B, C for, and, and I believe wave three, of the diagonal is finished. And then we get an A, B, C to the downside for wave four. And for this, I'm going to bring in the Hearst cycle analysis. I always make sure that my wave counts am, uh, are supported by Hearst cycle analysis. Why would I do that? The reason I do that is so I can't, so I won't thrust my either bullish or bearish uh, um, ideas on a wave count. Because when you're just doing wave counts, you can make them anything you want. If you want the market to stay up for much longer, you can make it look that way by just your labels on your LA wave chart. And then you can make a big deal about how you're bullish and everybody else is way too bearish. But what I do is I make sure that um, my wave counts are supported by her cycle analysis. Uh, and therefore I remove uh, any emotion from, from the proceedings. So here is uh, her cycle analysis on the Dow Jones industrial average. And this actually goes back all the way to uh, the roaring twenties peak. And so each these long cycles are 18 year cycles. That's this 18 year cycle right here. It was in 1982. That was the beginning of the most aggressive portion of this extended fifth wave um, in the Dow. And then the next one was in 2009. And then the next one is still out in front of us. So if we go back here and look at the phasing, We are in a very large 18 year cycle and within an 18 year cycle, there should be two nine year cycles. So that first nine year cycle that started in 2009 ended in March of 2020. And so now we're in the second, uh, we're in the second nine year cycle. That's this cycle right here. We're in the second nine year cycle of an 18 year cycle. The second nine year cycle with an 18 year cycle will be more bearish and it should top prior to the center point of the cycle. And that is exactly what Hearst is suggesting a left translated peak. And uh, that nine year cycle will consist of two four and a half year cycles. So we already have the largest cycle pushing down on price. We have the, that's the 18 year, the nine year cycle is the, no longer really pushing up or down on price. Now, theoretically this latest move up from this low, that would be the October low of 2023 
uh, has been bullish as it is the first 18 month cycle within uh, the next four and a half year cycle. But here's what the composite line is suggesting moving forward. And it, it's not pretty. So I'm going to bring in my wave count on this. So one of the diagonal, two of the diagonal, three of the diagonal finished, four of the diagonal down through July of this year, five of the diagonal up through September of the, this year, and that's it. That's the end. Now, remember, this orange line doesn't necessarily represent price. It represents direction. Direction. So if Hearst has this phased correctly, we're going to, we're starting to get a bounce out of a 20 week cycle trough. We're going to move up through approximately uh, April 27 down through May 4. And I, I think that th this was wave one or wave A, and we're going to get an ABC for wave B that's going to end approximately mid May. This is saying mid or May 12. And then is bullish, I'm sorry, bearish down into July, into a 40-week cycle trough. Then out of that low is your last, I think, major buying opportunity for the stock market if, and for a while. That would be starting in mid-July and moving up into mid-September. Yeah, and for those of you that are interested in where the election falls on this composite line, it falls basically right here. There, that is uh, November four, right there. And so, if this roadmap ends up correct, the the market is going to hate the election results. Just a sideline sideline piece of information there but anyway we're generally looking for downside into mid july upside into mid september so i have those dates i've placed right here on this chart and i'm showing you have it and and I, I remember saying that when this started taking off the upside and back in january that the market better watch out what it wishes for because if it goes on up and finishes wave three of the diagonal here, it, th that the diagonal will likely finish th this year instead of a couple of years from now, which is what I was thinking. We still had a couple of years left on the fin to finish the diagonal. But the fact that it, it went on up here in the first quarter of this year, um, it's pretty clear that that's just too much of a rise to expect that wave two is still underway. And I left that on there just to remind you. So, um, so I'm going to get rid of that. So there's the general roadmap on the Dow. Uh, so let's, I want to show you a couple other things about what, uh, what the market's been doing lately that are pretty interesting. On the Dow Jones Industrial Average, this is the low back in October 20, October 27. As a reminder, and you can go back on, on my YouTube channel and see that I called that low to the day and to the tick. And if there's any of my paying subscribers that are in the room, I would appreciate if you would confirm that in the room. But going into that weekend, I was saying this looks like the, the market is going to bounce right here and right now. Um, and that's what happened. And, and uh, what Hearst was suggesting at that time is, is that the market was going to move up through oh, uh, mid uh, to late uh, December. And so my comment was, well, if it's going to go up to, to that much, I'll, I'll put the recording on my, on my blog. Um, um, so I was expecting this to be probably the top. And so was Hearst at that moment. 
And I was thinking, well, the seasonality will probably keep it up through year end. There's year end right there. And, but, but it only pulled back through approximately mid January. And this is my trend following template. There's a custom indicator on, on this template called the ATR volatility stop. That's that blue line. And it, to be totally frank with you, I think is just extraordinary indicator. Um, and it's really assists in sticking with a trend as long as possible. You can see that this, um, the green boxes are green buy zone boxes. As long as price is above the blue line, it's considered to be in an uptrend. And that blue line pretty much held true on this uptrend that we saw since that October low. It only goofed up for about a day right here in mid January, but then it turned right back into bullish. And um, the odd thing about the move up was price was staying in this channel to the upside and in, in perfectly well, but it fell out of the channel here, but for some reason it wouldn't go down. Uh, it, it fell out of the channel and yet it kept grinding sideways and slightly to the upside. It was even more pronounced on the uh, trend contract, uh, the trend on the uh, ES contract. There was actually only one day that was January 31, where it gave a sell signal. The very next day, it gave a buy signal right back. That is the only waffling that it made. It also fell out of that up, upper channel, but kind of continued along the day underside of it. And it really didn't give warning that um, the the uptrend was over at the earliest until probably about um, April 4. And it's, it's, it's currently in a downtrend. Notice there's the blue uh, ATR volatility stop. So the, the trend is clearly has turned to the downside on stop market. Um, something else I wanted to show you uh, on, on the daily chart of, on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, that upward movement that occurred from uh, mid-January up into the all-time high, which on the Dow Jones Industrial Average had occurred on March 21. It was very choppy and noisy. Very choppy and noisy. I, I forced this count of a one, two, three, four, a five wave ending, expanding diagonal with the fifth wave being a ridiculous W, X, Y, X, Z, triple zigzag. Uh, very difficult counting there. Um, but I believe this is a an impulse to the downside. And it's probably wave A, and now we're getting wave B. We're probably going to get to continue on this ABC bounce until mid-May, and then looking to the downside down into mid-July. And from there, it looks like um, a nice move to the upside and the end of secular bull market that's been in place since 1932. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, another, I think, really important thing, and I, I showed it to you last week on the wave counts. I'm not last week, but last quarter. Last quarter is when we go to sectors, I want to show the financials, the XLF, and I also want to show um, the two Im most important sectors that are lagging. Well, one real important one is is the uh, Russell. I didn't, sh I hadn't shown that to you yet, but it it hasn't even come close to making a new high ab um, above the highs that it made back in late 2021. This is the transports. 
here's the upward movement on the transports. Does that look like an impulse to you? No way. It's very choppy. I, I think it's about to break down. And a Hearst on this thinks it's going to go down all the way into the first quarter of next year. Now, it also suspects that it will stay up until March of 2026, and that will be the end of this ending diagonal. Notice that this also, this move to the upside, is probably initial move up from the March of 2020 low, probably an ABC zigzag. Uh, utilities also nowhere near the, the all-time high that occurred back in uh, the second quarter of 2022, far, far below it. Um, and then I want to show you XLF. This is one of the more interesting uh, patterns. And um, recently, notice I'm, I'm counting this move up as wave one of an eventual ending diagonal up uh, from March of 2000 through January 2022. And then, <clears throat> um, actually, I would have to relabel this as a three-wave structure, but, but it has an obvious triangle in it. So this most recent blast to the upside from the October low of 2023 is clearly a terminal thrust out of a triangle, ABC, X, ABC. So I'm going to label this a little bit different back here. Y, this will be a W. This will be an X. This will be a Y, don't need that or that. And this will be an A. And so what it appears that we're getting in the XLF is a three wave move to the downside followed by essentially an A triangle for B, C finished. And that would be a terminal thrust. When a terminal thrust from a triangle is done, it's done. It apparently, I think, is done. And that uh, this little bounce is a chance to get out. And uh, we'll be moving down next, uh, at least through July and possibly longer. Uh, uh, it's Christy or Christian, I'm not sure which is, uh, the only, yeah, all, uh, the only one that I, I don't, let's see, let me look here, I can't, can't remember, let me look at the S&P, so the Dow, the one that I showed you, the Dow, yeah, topping in September. I, I would guess that it stays up a little longer than that going into the election. But uh, I'm moving back to the S&P real quick. Um, no, the, the roadmap on the S&P is a bit different. Um, and the reason is because I'm doing some repins. I'm forcing my opinion on it. And the reason I'm doing that is because I think I'm right. Uh, and, and it does give me a little bit more time. Um, uh, it gives this diagonal a little bit more time to unfold. So this part of the diagonal, the ABC to the downside is, is still, uh, I believe, correct down th through anywhere from late June through late September. But then the Hearst is, when I for do a couple of repins on it, allowing the market to stay up into the first quarter of next year. So that's the general 
idea on the SMP. And by the way, I'm, I, I have to do a couple of repins to force my opinion on it, on the SMP, but on the ES contract, I do not. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to show you on the ES contract, just using all data, first nominal model, troughs only, no repin. And I'm going to bring up that analysis. There, there is one additional thing to consider on the on these diagonals. There is something that can occur in an ending contracting diagonal, and that is that the fifth wave can truncate. The fifth wave can truncate. So it is possible that just a few days ago, we saw as high as the stock market will ever go. If, but in order for that to be correct, we the fifth wave coming up would have to truncate. And that would be very, very bearish. And um, these wave counts are bearish after this. They're quite bearish for years after this diagonal completes. Uh, I'll show you on the S&P why I was I counted this ABC off of this low zigzag off of this low from March of 2020. So one, two, three, four, five for A, and then B, and then one, two, three, four, five, and the the pink wave C of the zigzag stopped going up almost exactly on the S&P where it was a 0.618 expansion of A. So what an expansion is, you measure this distance from here to the pink A, that's the end of the, the initial five waves up. And then you take that times 0.618 and you add that product on to the top of wave A and you end up with this pink dotted line. It's about as perfect of a target as you can get for the end of wave C of a zigzag. Matter of fact, expansion targets, um, I think, are the most reliable, reliable tar targets for wave C of zigzags, and the 0.618 expansion, or possibly the 0.382 expansion of wave A. So three waves up for wave one, that is uh, indicated to me way back that that was probably wave one of an ongoing ending contracting diagonal. And then an inordinately shallow wave two, and then an A, B, and then an, an, a megaphone pattern. This explains why this was so aggressive to the upside. One, two, three, four, five, and ex ending expanding diagonal that stopped going up it, right as it was hitting the trend line extending from the extremes of one and three. And now we should get a five, three, five zigzag to the downside down through mid-year, possibly on into the third quarter. Um, <clears throat> this is the, and uh, no repins, I've not forced my opinion on, on it at all. Analysis of the ES contract. And here's what's super different about it than um, um, most other Hearst and uh, analysts. It's it's showing this a very long 18 month cycle from March of 2020 through uh, October of 2022, and then a short 18 month cycle, only one year, through the October of 2023. And then uh, this analysis, which is different than almost anything else, suggests that the market may be able to kind of stay up, but um, become very bearish down into this nest of troughs due actually in the middle of next year. So this kind of suggests that there would be a topping process all the way through late in the year. As a matter of fact, that last peak is where it's about ready to say good, but kiss, kiss it goodbye to the downside occurs right pretty much at the election. That's uh, October 29. 
So even though this is uh, really phasing the, the uh, troughs differently, it's suggesting that uh, once we get to the election, this, this market's toast. So, um, and then it's, now could it be that we're getting a one and then A, B, C for two, no, one, two, three of the diagonal, four of the diagonal, five of the diagonal, and maybe it lasts through the year 2027. I don't know. I just I will represent to you that the way this is phasing this across here is different than anything else. All of the others are putting an 18 month cycle trough back here in October of 2021. I want to show you what the composite line looks like if I do that. So it's, it's going to rethink about that a second. Um, and it's thinking any, anybody got any questions about anything else? Um, how about, how about bonds? Uh, what, why don't, what that, uh, is thinking off in a, on another monitor. I want to show you bonds uh, is, I think is one of the more interesting potential opportunities on the short term. So if we're going to see this pullback that just um, let's continue. So we just saw a, a peak a few days ago in a fairly aggressive move to the downside in the stock market. Now we're getting a bit of a bounce. I think it will only be a partial retrace. And then I think we get into a more aggressive move to the downside in the stock market down through mid-year, let's say July, August, possibly September. At some point, um, I believe that there's a tremendous amount of market participants that will want to exit their stocks and, and, and get into treasuries as a safe haven. I'm shown a little better on TLT. <clears throat> so her cycle analysis is expecting this to be a significant low in bonds and that we're going to move to the upside in bonds and therefore yields will be coming down or interest rates will be coming down. Not because the Fed said so, they all the Fed does is they really kind of adjust at on a lag to what the natural market does. For instance, the um, bonds topped in March of 2020, and it was only here when it looked bonds were moving into the point of recognition of the wave three of three to the downside that the Fed finally threw up their hands and said, okay, okay, we, we need to, we need to raise, we need to start raising. And they started, so they were extremely late. Normally they, they will start adjusting interest rates to, to match what the natural market is doing and on a five to seven month lag. Well, in this case, they waited two years. And what they allowed is they allowed, uh, by doing that, inflation to really catch hold. They really screwed up bad. And they allowed this this um, really um, aggressive move to the upside in inflation. And they were very late in trying to fight it. And... Um, if this roadmap is correct, yes, they will be able to start easing at some point, possibly this year, later this year. But the reason they'll be easing is because bonds, there will be this flight to safety out of stocks into bonds. In other words, because the bond, the stock market will be weak. Uh, ultimately, because they we could just simply look at the bond market and have a pretty good idea of what they're going to do in a few months. Um, all of their talk, talk, talk is really worthless. And they really lost credibility on this one bad. Um, so I think bonds will bounce here. Hearst uh, is, is calling that October low of last year, very 
potentially a nine year cycle trough. And this would be the first 20 week cycle trough after a nine year that, that would suggest strong upside here. Um, so the repin that I did on the ES contract is finished and it really isn't making much sense other than it just made it that much more bearish after a, a potential bounce up through. Yeah, that's nothing else is saying that nothing else is delivering that message. I'll try to get it to mimic what the S and P is suggesting. So hang on. Actually, I've never done that before. I think, you know, I'm not going to go ahead and show that. What time is it? 825. We've been going for uh, almost an hour and a half. Any other questions from the gallery that I can show you? Uh, before before we call into this one. As a reminder, um, if you have not subscribed before and you would like a uh, 50% refund off your first month, um, all you have to do is email me. My email address is Sid at elliotwaveplus.com say hey sid uh this is fred i haven't subscribed before but i liked your presentation i think i'd like it to give it a shot and uh well will you refund 50 percent of my first uh, month payment and i just like yes i will i'll check to see that if you've subscribed before but then i will uh, immediately refund or within that same day refund 50 uh, percent of your first month back to you uh if, if you want to know more about um, the the pricing of the different tiers the way you get to that is you go to my site and you scroll down scroll down it does some explanations about me and everything let's say just pick one of these you might be interested in it'll show you there's no commitment on on checking through. So if you're interested in the pro, pro plan and you want one of my weekly webinars every Sunday, this is by far my most popular tier. It's $100 a month and I cover a ton of stuff during my webinar. I also send out screenshots to you of the most popular items on Mondays and up, updated charts on Wednesdays. When you hit pricing, you go get to this pricing page. It's elliotwayplus.com slash pricing. There's the different tiers. If you hit subscribe, you fill out this form, you subscribe. I'll see the subscription come through. Send me the email and ask for the 50% refund. I'll give it to you. No questions from the gallery. Okay. Well, thank you so much um, for joining me uh, this quarter. Plan on having these every quarter. Uh, the reason I d do it isn't for people to compare my analysis from one quarter to the next. That honestly is somewhat silly as Elliott Wave counts and her cycle analysis, they morph over time. Some, and the more the better you are at your Elliott wave counts, the less you have to change your counts. And, um, but they do have to, I have to make adjustments from time to time on both the Elliott wave and the first analysis. So the best thing to do, if you, if you want to stay involved with these markets is to subscribe to a plan and get my information a couple of times a week. Thanks a lot. Uh, and, uh, hope to see you on the email. Have a great one. Bye-bye.